Hey everybody, it's your boy Dr. Markless. Before we get into today's episode, we're going to hit up the primarycarepod at gmail.com inbox. That's a place that you can send me jokes, uh, send me articles to read, uh, ta- uh, uh, give feedback, concerns. Uh, I'm just rambling at this point. Okay, but today we're going to hit up a joke at the primarycarepod at gmail.com. Dr. List, I have a joke for you. I just got a job in a factory making plastic Dracula toys. There are only two of us on the production line, so I have to make every second count. Let's start the podcast. The Primary Care Podcast is written and edited by a family physician for an audience of other physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, residents, and medical students interested in primary care topics. This is not a podcast for patients. It should not be used as medical advice. This is also a personal podcast produced on my own time and solely reflecting my personal opinions. Statements of this podcast do not reflect the views or policies of my employer, past or present, or any other organization with which I may be affiliated. Thank you for listening to the Primary Care Podcast. I'm Dr. Mark List, here to bring you the latest news, guidelines, and updates from primary care sources around the globe. Keeping it under 15 minutes long because you're in a hurry and I'm not that smart. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the Primary Care Podcast. Pod girls, pod boys, pod people. It is your boy, Dr. Mark List, your favorite podcasting host. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about a topic that I think is the future of cancer screenings. And and I think that, right, I, I take a different approach to cancer screenings. Than I think a lot of people do, or maybe I don't. Maybe I, I maybe I think I'm more unique than I am. And, and that is the USPFTF have. I, I love their recommendations from the United States Preventative Task Force Services um, Services Task Force. Um, I think that the um, their approach is wonderful, and I think that uh, you have to keep cancer screenings simple because as primary care clinicians and as people who are have busy busy practices who see a lot of people, it's hard to remember. Uh, various different strategies, right? So having a, you know, 45 to 75 or 50 to 75 um, cancer screening recommendation uh, every year, every two years, whatever the case may be, you have to keep it simple because it's too hard to, you know, to have a complicated algorithm to apply to the entirety of the population. That being said, we have talked on this podcast a lot about relevant statistics when it comes to cancer screenings and that, you know, in, in many of these cancer screening trials, the number needed to screen is well over 100, which means that in your practice, you know, uh, for example, it, let's say a, a, a common one that I see is a number needed to screen around two to 300 depends on the cancer, right? So in that case, you need to screen 200 plus patients in order for one patient to benefit from that cancer screening, correct? And in the meantime, there's all kind of false positives or risks, but because cancer is such a definitive diagnosis and is such a a big deal and a big cause of morbidity and mortality, there is incredible value in finding that one person. And here, there's a research article from the Annals of Internal Medicine. And this is, I think, where the future of medicine lies. When we can, using other pieces of research, drill down into having better patient-focused, patient-centered decision-making, where we have a shared decision based on the risks and the benefits of an individual patient, um, I think that's where the true value lies, right? This is why I like the um, American Heart Association uh, 7.5% ASCVD risk, because I think that it's not just, okay, you hit 45 and you have an elevated cholesterol, boom, here you go, here's your medicine. I think that there's some value in, in individualizing that risk and having those conversations with people. So this is an article just from a couple of weeks ago in May of 2021, early May 2021, from the Annals of Internal Medicine, incorporating baseline breast density when screening women at average risk for breast cancer. So we're going to get rid of all our high-risk people. We're going to get rid of the people who um, have, you know, a super, super strong family history, people that are um, have BRSA 1 and 2, BRCA1, BRCA2 positive. We're going to get rid of those people, and we're just going to talk about the average woman. Okay, so the average woman, you know, and, and right now we talk about how compared to um, the United States version, there are other there are other models out there that are being used, right? So in Britain, for example, the National Health uh, Service recommends screening. Hold on, I'm going to pull this up because I am not British. Um, for my British listeners, I apologize. Okay, I found it. Um, the NHS invites eligible women to breast cancer screening every three years after age 50. And there's a lot of, you know, different, even in the United States, right? That's just, just a USPSTF. 
Um, but there's the American Cancer Society guidelines and recommendations. There's the ACOG guidelines and recommendations, which are a little bit more aggressive for lots of reasons um, that probably aren't always evidence-based. And, and so they looked at in this, they used modeling data and modeling research. And we all know Dr. List's opinion about modeling overview. And yes, I know these are not randomized control trials. And yes, this is not like the highest of highest grade statistical models that we should be using. I mean, they're not the, they're not evidence-based. They're more just theoretical in a perfect world, yada, yada, yada. And I know that I'm going to need to get over this because it's really expensive and really cumbersome and takes a lot of time to do randomized control trials, especially on cancer screenings. And again, the cancer screening you know, trials that we do have don't show that high of number needed to screens. So using modeling data that could illustrate in a perfect world under ideal conditions, you know, talking about the average sensitivity and specificity of these screens, what should we expect? So basically they used modeling data to run a, a wide range of models, okay? So there's actually seven different screened, okay? So um, number one, the strategy that they looked at in these models were no screening, right? What was the mortality, morbidity, et cetera, as kind of a baseline if, if they did a model with no screening? Number two, uh, every three years, uh, screening 50 to, at age 50 to 75, right? That's the NHS, uh, the National Health Service, right? So number three, um, the, they used the USPF, PSTF, the twice a year, starting from 50 to 75. Then they started stratifying annual mammography at age 50 to 75 with, despre- with dense breasts at age 50 and tri year, so every three years from 70, 50 to 75. Okay, so they, they, they stratified annual for people with de- dense breasts and every three years for people without dense breasts, right? Then they had another trial, which was annual uh, 50 to 75 for dense breasts and every two years for, for low risk people without dense breasts, 50, uh, 50 to 75. And then, and then they stratified annual breast cancer from 40 to 75 in one group uh, with dense breasts and then uh, 50 to 75 in those without. And then they did one where they screened at age 40 to determine if they had dense breasts or not dense breasts. Uh, so a stratified annual mammography at age 40 to 75 with dense breasts, and then twice a year, 50 to 75 for those without dense breasts. Oh, my goodness. Whew. Okay, that was a lot of reading. So why does this matter? Well, we know that the average woman has a, about a 1 in 8 risk for breast cancer. And we also know since 1976, we've recognized that having dense breaths, breasts, not breaths, but breasts um, on mammography puts you at risk for breast cancer, okay? And so when we talk about the um, mammographic findings, right? So BIRADs A and B are uh, scattered glandular density, heterogeneously dense, uh, sorry, uh, almost entirely fatty is A, scattered areas of fibroglandular density of B, okay? Those are considered to be, A and B are considered to be not dense. And then C and D are heterogeneously dense and extremely dense. And we know that, you know, C and D are about 50% and A and B are about 50%. So about half women are in the low risk group, about 50% of people are in the high risk group. And yet none of the current screening guidelines uh, have any bearing on density of breasts, right? There's a individual, you can leave it up to individual patient preference at age 40, according to the USPSTF. And NHS says basically start at 50 in every three years. Okay. And so, right, the entire purpose of these modeling studies here is to see, is there a difference if we risk stratify based on dense breasts, right? Should we be doing a, a screen at age 40 to assess how dense your breasts are and then put you basically in two different profiles. And how does that compare uh, statistically to the USPSTF recommendations, to the NHS guidelines, and then have this you know, uh, baseline group that has no screening. So what did they find? Well, no surprise, but they did find that screening based on breast density does find more breast cancers, does avert more breast cancer deaths, uh, breast cancer deaths with higher levels of screening. And so they, they ultimately found that probably the best, and not probably, but statistically the best screening group, if all you were focused on were finding cancers and, and averting deaths, was the 
first time screen at age 40 with a mammography with mammography in order to determine the density of breaths breaths and then offer annual at age 40 starting at age 40 for dense breaths and biannual after age 50 for people at low risk aka those with more fatty breast tissue okay but that is there and, and if you look at and you just read the abstract and i'm going to flip back here if you just read the abstract, they talk about results, basically a baseline screen at age 40, followed by annual at age 40 to 75 for dense breaths, that's that's C and D, um, and then every two years screen at age 50 to 75 for people without breath, death, dense breaths was an effective and cost-effective screening, um, talking about increasing quality of life years compared to just the USPSTF recommendations. And so they have a conclusion that the study findings advocate for breast density stratified screen with a baseline mammography at age 40 years. <clears throat> so their results and conclusions are not technically incorrect. And I really do think it has very high value to have these conversations with people, with patients, with women, about the fact that if we did a baseline screen at age 40 in somebody who was at average risk, that yes, we could determine if you had a higher level of risk based on the density of your breasts. And yes, if we did screen annually in that case with higher density of breasts, you might benefit statistically more than the baseline USPSTF or the NHS guidelines. But how much more? And that's where, as you know, I like to dig into the details. And that's why you come to the podcast, right? And so the more aggressive we get, the the higher the risks of false negatives or sorry false positives and the higher risk of benign breast biopsies and the risk for overscreening cases right so i overdiagnosis of cancer screenings and we're going to talk about all these in details but let's talk about the value right so if you did more aggressive compared to compared to no screening the average value per 1000 women screened okay so compared to no screening if you use the nhs which is every 3 years about eight women per thousand, you find, you you save eight breast cancer deaths. Okay, eight eight point six per thousand. Okay, um, if you do the USPSTF, which is every two years after age fifty, you save about ten lives. Okay, uh, ten lives uh, breast cancer deaths averted with screening. Okay, that's pretty good. As you go up and up and up the chain, all the way to the most aggressive, which is if you screen for the, if you screen at age 40, everyone, and then risk stratify. So if you have dense breasts, you go to annual and you do either every three years or every two years if you're at low risk, okay? The three-year group was 12.5 breast cancer deaths averted with screening. And the every two years after age 50, if you're low risk, would be 13.2 breast cancer deaths. So again, a, a small marginal benefit compared to, so five per 1,000 women. Now, again, those are deaths uh, per 1,000 women screened. And that five, obviously, is the difference between the the most uh, laxed screening group every three years versus the most intense screening group, which is annual for the high risk and every two years for the low risk. So uh, a difference of five deaths per 1,000 women. But I think it's really important to note that those other, you know, in the in the lowest risk group for let's use the USPFTF, which is the every two years after age 50 recommendation, 990 women do not benefit compared to no brass cancer screenings in terms of cancer deaths averted. Even in this model, right? Um, you only save 10 lives screening a thousand women, and so changing it from that guideline up to the more aggressive, more tailored breast density guideline gives you three more lives saved per 1,000 people. Now, if our goal is to eliminate every possible breast cancer death, that, that is a potential um, way that we can be flexible in our cancer screenings. We can talk to our high-risk patients about maybe going more aggressively. But what price does this come at? When we get more aggressive with annual cancer screenings versus every two-year cancer screenings and starting earlier, the false positive screens per 1,000 patients compared to no screen go up from, let's use again, the USPFTF 
every two years after age 50, okay, you have about 200 false positive screens per 1,000 women. So about one in five women, or you know, one woman getting multiple times, but about one in five uh, cases will have a false positive screen and lead to breast biopsies in 22 out of those 1,000 women. Okay, you can argue very strongly, and I always strongly uh, argue that any false positive screen, any benign breast biopsy, is not benign because those women have intense anxiety usually associated with this. Uh, some women do not. Some women say, "Oh, well, you know, we'll we'll take a look at it," and they don't get too upset by it. But I know many, many women that are very stressed out by this. And in the using the USPFTF recommendations, 14 out of those thousand women screened will be overdiagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, you know, ductal carcinoma in situ, vulva biopsy that actually shows a very low grade localized breast cancer that would probably never cause the woman any problems in her lifetime and, and probably wouldn't lead to any issues. And again, that's 12 cases per 1,000 versus eight women, or sorry, 10 women that we are saving their lives. So we're almost having as many overdiagnosed cases as we are saving of lives saved. And we're having double the amount of breast biopsies benign breast biopsies than we are cancer death saves. And we're having more than 20 times as many false positive mammographies requiring repeat imaging than we are breast cancer deaths averted. And so I'm not here advocating against breast cancer screening, although I think that there's it is low yield compared to many other things that we do. I'm just saying we need to be having these conversations with our patients. Now, again, I, I really think that the more finely tuned that we can make cancer screenings, that we can be more aggressive with the people who are at risk and less aggressive with the people who aren't at risk, right? I think there's high value in that. And this study shows that we can tune down and find more breast cancer deaths and avert more breast cancer, breast cancer deaths if we risk stratify. But at what cost? Compared to the USPFTF recommendation, their recommendation of annual breast with dense breaths leads to 567 false positive screens per 1,000 women. That's almost two and a half times more false positive screens than just using the plain old USPSTF recommendations. The number of breast biopsies that end up being benign triples when you get more intense annual screening for dense breasts. Dense breasts. And the overdiagnosis cases go from 12 up to 18. So a relative risk increase of almost 50% uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a absolute risk of six women per 1,000 screens. This leads to a cost, additional cost in dollars per 1,000 women of half a million dollars, just in 1,000 women. And then we have to apply this to the entire population. And in the U.S., that's a big number, right? Okay, so a lot of numbers today. But I think that the important take-home point is I am somebody who strongly believes that keeping it simple and cancer guideline screens are easy to recommend are highly valuable, but potentially tailoring your individual conversations with patients on their breast cancer risk or even cancer risk in general has high value. Talking if you're low risk, let's not worry so much about screening. Maybe let's even go to less aggressive screening if you're low risk. Fatty, fatty breast tissue, no family history. Maybe we can scale back the amount of screens that we do. And then this idea that we can increase the intensity and the frequency of breast cancer screening in women that have dense breasts has some value, but it has incredible potential costs. And when I see a headline, and again, I, I love this research because this is the type of uh, strategy that I think the United States needs to be going to and the world needs to be going to in terms of cancer screens to get more tailored to high-risk patients. But this study basically completely blew off the cons of being more aggressive which as I just, I just read those numbers, is intense. Almost two and a half times the number of positive screens with the more aggressive, being more aggressive, over you know 50% higher rates of over diagnosis, triple the rates of benign breast biopsies needed. Um, again, high, high, high risk, incredible amounts more cost, incredible amount of more stress for patients, the more aggressive that we get with cancer screenings, with very little benefit. Again, 10 women saved in the per 1,000 women screened in the normal uh, USPFTF recommendations, up to 13 with the most aggressive screening recommendations. Again, there's always a trade-off, the pros and the cons. 
And if you're like me, a medical nihilist, I think the less aggressive we get with people, the better. And uh, in general, I think that's usually the best strategy. Uh, again, you don't need to agree with me on this. I know there's many people that disagree with me and they get annual breast cancer screenings on everybody. I think that's fine as long as you have the risks and conversations with your patients. But I think too many women in this country are getting annual mammography who are average risk, um, who are probably being harmed by that much more than they are being benefited by it. And it's being driven by a medical industrial complex that is trying to sell mammography and try to get more of these screens in, not only for cost, but also because we have pink ribbons in October and we have breast cancer awareness months and, oh, you're at risk for breast cancer, mammography is going to save lives. Well, sure, it saves a little bit of life, saves some lives, but a lot more women are probably harmed by mammography than have benefited from it. So um, that's my take on the situation. Um, love to hear your feedback. Again, hit us up at primarycarepod at gmail.com. Thanks for tuning in this week. Uh, remember, reminder, you don't need to stay up all night to stay up to date. Uh, thank you. God bless.